So everyone could come on in. Please have a seat. It's time to get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Nichols. I'm the current core coordinator, and I want to welcome you to the last core lecture here at St. Joseph's College. And what we've planned for you this morning is a series of reflections by the past core coordinators on what core has meant to the institution, what it's meant to students, what it has meant to us personally. And so after this brief introduction, we're going to turn it over to Dr. John Nichols, and then we'll hear from Father Tim McFarland, and then we'll hear from Dr. Mike Malone. Uh, before I do that, though, there are a few people that I want to recognize. The first is Dr. Ann Gull, who's the core six director. And she very graciously allowed us to use this time period, which would normally be a core six lecture to have this commemoration. So thank you, Dr. Gold, for that. <laughs> there are also two core coordinators who could not be here today. Uh, the first that I want to recognize is Father William Kramer, uh, whose picture I pulled from uh, the college archives. He was the very first core coordinator from 1968 to 1973, he passed a few years ago, and so we want to recognize him today. The other is Father Bill Stang, who was core coordinator from 2013 to 16, and because of a conflict, he was unable to be with us today. So with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. John Nichols, if you would like to say a few words, please do. It hasn't been that long. Is it working? OK. It hasn't been that long since I've given a core lecture, but it feels very different to be up here. I'm deliberately starting with something that a very important visitor said about St. Joseph's College in 2008. This was uh, Dennis O'Brien, who was formerly the president of the University of Rochester in New York, and he came here to give some presentations on Catholic higher education. He was a very perceptive and critical uh, visitor, and very generous in what he said at the end. He published an article in Common Wheel in March of 2008, and the cover, of course, is the Twin Towers, and it's a tribute to the core curriculum. And here's what Dennis said. He started out by saying, I don't know if anybody got anything out of my talks at the college. However, I learned a great deal at St. Joseph's about actually doing Catholic higher education. It is all well and good to write a book about the idea of Catholic higher education. And he did that. That's why he was here. It is quite a different thing to see it accomplished on the ground. St. Joseph actually has a coherent, comprehensive idea about what constitutes higher education. And it has made it real and in an effective and Catholic core curriculum. It's a wonderful tribute to the, what we have developed here. It's an amazing story, and I'd like to give you a, a few of the events along the way to try to figure out how did this happen. Um, I'm going to divide it into three stages. The first stage is that of creating and inventing the core curriculum, and that lasted about 10 years. And then another 10 years of moving into the mainstream of American higher education, as well as Catholic higher education. And then the final years are years of actual leadership in those areas. My wife, Connie, and I moved to Rensselaer in the summer, fall of 1968. And about two months after we got here, the faculty of the college voted to move from its distributional general education program to this thing called a core curriculum. The vote was generous, it was three to one, and immediately after the vote, the planning started because the next fall, fall of 69, core one 
the freshman core had to start. And so those core sections, uh, core semester programs, were introduced one after the other so that the class of 1973 was the first class that had gone through all 10 of the cores. Uh, in the summer of 1973, I was asked to be the core coordinator, and that lasted all the way until 1996. I can date our movement into the mainstream in the year 1979. In that year, we had two grants. The first one was from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities that gave us enough money to run a workshop on campus on how to design a core curriculum. There were 60 professors and administrators from 20 other institutions who spent the entire week here and we sort of bared our souls and let them in on all of the high points and the low points of putting together a core curriculum. It worked because at the end they gave us, at the final presentation, they gave us a standing ovation. And their general comment was, it's working here. And so we were really pumped up by that feedback from fairly critical uh, colleagues at other institutions. The second grant was from the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education. And we used our money to find out what happens to students as they move from core one through the other cores all the way to core 10. And we conducted roughly 200 very well-structured and probing uh, interviews of students. And we learned something. We, the faculty, the whole community learned something. What the students told us is, you faculty think that core is the distinctive thing about education here. It's not. From our point of view, what is truly, really distinctive in its impact on us is the interplay between the major and core during every one of the eight semesters. And so we rethought the undergraduate curriculum from the point of view of the students. In 1984, good old NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities, published a booklet to the nation called to reclaim a legacy. And the chairman of NEH in that booklet said, there are three bright spots in the whole country as far as humanities education is concerned, and St. Joseph's was number one of those three. 1986, Bill Parrott, William Perry from Harvard, who wrote the book that is probably the most uh, influential book on intellectual and moral development in the college years. Bill and I happened to be on a panel for a workshop at a college in North Carolina and afterwards we started talking about the core program. I sent him some materials and then he sent me a handwritten letter that is among my most prized possessions where he said, people always ask me what kind of a curriculum can we set up in order to promote student development intellectually and morally? And he said, I could never answer that question for them. But he said, now I can send them to you to ask about your core program, but because to me, that seems to be the perfect way to go about promoting intellectual and ethical development. Leadership. I already mentioned what uh, Dennis O'Brien said, but in the course of the 48 years that CORE has been in operation, the college has participated in seven different national projects on general education. And the last four of them, the college, St. Joseph's College, played the leading role. In the last four of those projects, I happen to be the project director and people from the college, Father Kirch, Father McFarland, uh, Brother Reuter, Mike Ballone, others have participated in making those projects successful ones. They were projects for secular liberal education. They were projects for Catholic higher education. And then the topic that is sort of a bugaboo in higher education, assessment of student learning was two of those projects. 
I didn't answer the question that I put to you. I was going to say, how did all this come about? And I told you what happened. How did it happen? I think there are two elements that are absolutely, absolutely critical. Dedication and talent. When those two things come together, there is synergy. You really and truly find out that the whole is greater than just a simple sum of the parts. The interaction of talented and dedicated people produced the core curriculum. All through the, the years that I was the core coordinator and all through the years that I've been here at the college, I am always astounded by how dedicated this faculty has been and is. There was a critical number of faculty members who simply would not let the core curriculum fail, no matter what the problems were. They would put in the time, the effort, and bring all of their talents to bear on solving the problem. If either one of those elements, dedication or talent, is missing, things fall apart. And this is not the occasion on which to talk about that, but we have experience of that also. So I would like to invite some members of the Alumni Association to get together with me to talk about making additional copies of this booklet that is a memoir on the development of the core program over those years that contains a lot more detail about the things that I just skimmed over very briefly here. To make that available to the alumni, it would be, judging by what the alumni said last weekend at the Little 500, that would make a wonderful souvenir of their years going through the core program. I now have the pleasure of passing the microphone to Father Tim McFarland, who was my successor as the core coordinator. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Um, for those of uh, my colleagues who have heard Dr. Nichols and some of the uh, 96 uh, live stream viewers here, uh, it just didn't seem right to see Dr. Nichols up here without the Elmo projector. Uh, one of the, I think, kind of picking up on some of what uh, Dr. Nichols was saying, uh, and I think my colleagues would speak for this as well, and I think uh, you current students here, to some degree or another, depending upon your progress in the core curriculum, one of the, the beauties, I think the greatest accomplishments of the core curriculum is uh, this integrative habit of mind. As Dr. Nichols said, looking at you know, the progress of students through core and seeing how uh, the, the connection with the major with core has been a real uh, asset that students kind of pick up themselves. I think one of the other things as we see in the core curriculum that we have all kind of uh, noticed is seeing how the different areas of knowledge, these academic disciplines kind of fit together. Um, I know personally for me as I went through the core, I think I was the fifth class that went through core uh, as a whole, uh, it affected my own intellectual development and as I had started studying theology, it really made an impact, uh, like putting things together and seeing the connections between different things. Um, as I've taught seniors for the most uh, last 15 or so years, uh, it's been really a joy for me to see how students are able to kind of connect with uh, their majors with, with other majors in, in class discussions and seeing how all this fits together. Uh, it's, and with faculty members. We work very hard uh, during the summers to kind of plan the core curriculum and this institution I think is unique in the way that we have a collegiality among our faculty members. We've got mathematicians sitting down with political scientists, with philosophers, uh, planning out a core curriculum. I have uh, went to a number of other institutions to did some consulting, and when I talked to them about that, they just marveled at, at what we were able to do where these, as we call department silos, were kind of not present here. One of the other things, and I think that particularly here uh, in Course 6, 
that you've been kind of looking at is seeing, you know, that we can't just look at the world through blinders, through one particular discipline. Uh, it takes all kinds of different knowledge uh, that we, we need to have together. And I think that's one of the, uh, again, the strong points that we have in the core curriculum is that we were able to see different things. And as you progress in your studies of your majors in core discussions, you're able to bring the knowledge of your major and interact with uh, these different majors. I think there was a real effort uh, in Core 6 uh, this semester and the past couple semesters to try to show, you know, we can't just look at the world through the eyes of a biologist or a chemist, physicist. It's just, there's just more that we need in this very complex world that we see. Uh, for faculty, uh, we have been challenged to work together and a lot, for a lot of new faculty coming in, it's kind of outside of our comfort zones. As we approach graduate studies, our focus kind of tends to narrow in. And in the core curriculum, really, it's kind of the opposite. We take our uh, discipline and we just have a much broader view of the world. And that challenged uh, faculty members coming out of graduate school, coming here, uh, seeing, you know, outside of their comfort zone. But gradually, people, you know, buy into it. And I think for those of us who have worked in the core curriculum for a number of years, see, it has been a real benefit to our intellectual development. Um, as I mentioned before, we experience a collegiality, a working together here that I don't know can be found at any other place. And that is truthfully uh, one of the things that I think uh, personally that I'm going to be miss about uh, St. Joseph's College in that having the opportunity to work with some very, very great colleagues and the ability that we have to kind of, you know, see the other's point of view and work together. Uh, faculty have also, in the past years, done a lot of work in faculty development because outside of our comfort zone, we need, you know, how do you teach a core class? Kind of the first um, question that comes from new faculty members. Well, we've done a lot of uh, faculty development, and you'll see a, a picture here of one of our faculty development workshops that we did in the summer. Uh, there were uh, almost every summer we had different uh, faculty development workshops, uh, very practical things like how to lead discussion, uh, looking at evaluating writing, uh, just intellectual kinds of development. Uh, faculty members uh, and core coordinators we've had the opportunity to consult at a lot of other uh, institutions and they marvel at what, we're able, what we've been able to do here at St. Joseph's College. And that I think is a tribute uh, to a lot of the faculty members that we've had here throughout the ages. Uh, so for students and alumni, um, I would get and still get, and as uh, uh, Dr. John Nichols said, uh, over this w past weekend, a lot of the alums say, you know, what an impact. And for those current students, a lot of times, you know, it doesn't quite sink in. You know, what do we have to take this car for? Um, and it, uh, but until like senior year, and then often when they get out into the world, uh, there's been so many that have written, have talked, and said what an impact that CORE has had on them and their ability to, uh, to communicate with others, to feel comfortable in presentations, and the breadth of knowledge that they have. Uh, I remember one student was talking that uh, there was in their corporation, there was somebody, they were moving to uh, India or something like that, or going to, and so this, uh, our, one of our alums was able to say, oh yeah, in India, this, this, and everybody looked at him and said, well, how do you know that? Well, that was part of what we studied in CORE. So there were lots of stories about alums and the impact that both in terms of the knowledge and the skills that were learned. Um, the skills that we looked at in core, the writing, uh, the speaking and thinking, thinking critically, having to think on your feet in discussion and being able to interact with other people, those are also uh, lots of things that I've heard from alums in, uh, in their reflecting on core, they're coming back and saying, you know, this really had an impact. Uh, graduate schools, you know, uh, the infamous Core 10 paper of 20 pages, you know. Students get through that, then they get into graduate school, they're having to write, you know, most often in a graduate course, a 20-page paper. Their classmates are just, you know, frantic. They don't know, oh, we've done that. So there's been any number of, of things like that. 
And there's one story that I remember of an alum who was talking to me, and he was in, in uh, sales. And he was really getting pressure from his uh, managers to make more sales. You know, even if the person doesn't need this, you got to sell it to them. You got to increase sales. And he had actually done his paper on uh, uh, business ethics and, and with regard to sales. And he just became increasingly uncomfortable with that attitude. And so he had, uh, actually had called me and said, "What do I do?" I said, "Well, what you know? What do you think?" I just this just does not seem right to me. And as a result, then, he decided to quit that job because he, it just did not fit with him, with his beliefs, with his attitudes, with his values, and so he pursued another job. The, again, the impact of what Core had on his life. I just picked out uh, three individuals here who this one may be watching on live stream. Uh, these are a couple of my students uh, looking back at what they do. First one is Judy Dever. Uh, Judy is currently the Deputy uh, Corporation Counsel of the Labor Division for the Chicago, City of Chicago Labor Department. Uh, this is what Judy had to say. She said, St. Joseph's College helps to instill self-confidence in their students, which is an important asset to have when choosing certain careers. A second asset is the core program, which taught me how to think, how to process information, and not just memorize facts. Another one, Bill Gill. Um, I saw both of these last weekend. Bill is an accountant. He is the compliance manager for the Simon Property Group. Uh, he works out of Indianapolis. Uh, Bill said, the liberal arts education I received at St. Joe taught me how to think outside the box, to be confident in a variety of situations, and hold my own in front of the highest levels of management within my organization. Uh, what he said. And it was interesting, I had Bill as a freshman in Core 2, and then later in Core 10. Uh, and just to see the development that he had from as a freshman to a senior, uh, it was just remarkable. Last one is Matt Stout. He's class of 2002. Again, uh, he's an accountant, CPA. He says, though I whined daily about Core, and that is true. Um, he said, the range of knowledge and the academic discipline it provided me has been invaluable in the professional world. When talking to clients, subjects outside accounting often come up, and having a broader base of knowledge allows you to avoid being pigeonholed into a certain field of study. That, I think, is one of the greatest accomplishments that we can look back with pride at what we were able to do in these 48 years of our core curriculum. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Mike Malone, who was my successor as core coordinator. Dr. Malone. Good morning. Is my uh, microphone working? Is this, uh, is this better? Okay, well good morning. I was, uh, as Tim indicated, uh, the coordinator of the CORE program following uh, him. I served CORE for uh, four years as the CORE coordinator. And um, I came to St. Joseph's College in 1996. So I've been here for 20 years and in that time I've probably given scores of CORE lectures. I think in almost every CORE and I've also given presentations to faculty in summer development workshops and presentations to colleagues at other places. But I think today in this morning, I'm having trouble speaking. And so if you can uh, bear with me a little bit, it is an emotional moment for me as we bring the core program to an end. I've uh, assembled a couple quotes that I think are relevant for our understanding of core and my perception and appreciation of the core program. And the first one is the one on the screen. It's from Yates, and he says, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And I think what Yates means by that is education is a lot more than simply giving students knowledge, filling their heads with facts. It is about ultimately passion and conviction, helping students understand what is important and what isn't important and helping students, in a certain sense, light fires in their minds and in their souls 
And I think for a great many of our students, for a great many of our graduates, for a great many of the alumni who are watching this, we in fact have done that. We have lit a lot of fires since 1968. And for that reason, I am very proud of our core program and very proud of the work that we've done. A second quotation, this is from Benjamin Franklin. He said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. What I think is unique about our core program is that it emphasizes, encourages and requires involvement from the students and from the professors. When I was an undergraduate at St. Louis University, I was in an undergraduate class usually of 30 to 40 students. I could sit in the back and I never had to become engaged. I never, I could check out, I could hide so to speak. But in core classes it's very difficult to hide. We cap the core classes at 16 to 18 students. And if you're in the core building, you're usually in a square. Um, there is no back of the room, so to speak. If there are individual desks, the instructor usually says, let's form a circle. And sooner or later, someone, your professor or another student in the class, is going to turn to you and they're going to say, what do you think about this issue? What do you think is right or wrong? What do you think is good or bad? What do you think we should do in this situation. And students are encouraged to get involved. And oftentimes in core, as many students know, we have some passionate, sometimes some angry discussions. Sometimes we have to fight through apathy, but more often than not, every student sooner or later knows they have to be involved in the core discussion. And it's those discussions, those acts of involvement that I think really produce, as Franklin said, <clears throat> the learning that takes place. I usually will tell this anecdote uh, at the beginning of a semester when I teach in the freshman course, and I've used it before, and I'd like to repeat it. It's an anecdote from Lewis and Faye Copeland. I'll uh, read it and you can follow it along. Said the professor, <clears throat> if there are any idiots in the room, please stand up. A long pause, and then a lone freshman stood up. What, do you consider yourself an idiot, asked the professor. Well, not exactly that, sir, but I do hate to see you standing by yourself. <laughs> when I came to St. Joseph's in 1996, and I learned about the core program, initially, I have to admit, I wasn't happy about it. I'd been spending five years studying a very narrow, and I thought important field in philosophy, and all of a sudden I was told that I would be leading discussion on the American Revolution and the Civil War in Core 2, that I would be leading discussion on Greek tragedy and drama in Core 3, eventually that I would be leading discussion on climate change in Core 5. And I thought, well, I don't know. I'm afraid that this is an area outside of my expertise and I may look like an idiot standing up in front of these students. But what I came to recognize as I went through the Core program is that in the best sense of the word, I was never standing alone. I could always turn to the students and say, you know, I really don't understand this passage from this text we're reading. What do you guys think it means? And students would chime in and offer their interpretations. And together, we could discover perhaps what the author meant. Or I could turn to the students and I would say, you know, I know the lecturer said this, but I'm not sure I agree with him. What do you think about it? And they would chime in and tell me what they think the lecturer meant and whether or not he or she was right. It's this communal activity of core that I think is so special for the students and for the faculty. And in this regard, I never felt I was standing alone with regard to my relationship with the colleagues. As uh, Father Tim mentioned, we plan these courses together. It's a team effort. And oftentimes when we're planning the core, we sometimes argue, we sometimes laugh, sometimes we get angry. But in doing that, we form ties, we form bonds that I think are unique to other institutions of higher ed. And the faculty has never let me feel that I was standing alone. I could always go to Maya Hawthorne and say, Maya, what are you going to do with this reading? What questions do you have for the students? Or I could go to Peter Watkins or Jody Watkins or John Ray or a host of other faculty. And together, we were never really standing alone. And that brings me to my next point. Um, the second goal of the core program that the founders of the core program developed was this one, to build a community 
of seekers after truth. And the word that I'd like to emphasize there is community. The word truth has a rather complicated history in philosophy, but the word community, I think, is pretty clear. It's sometimes overused, but I think one of the things that CORE does best is to build a community of learners. Uh, because oftentimes in our core discussions, things sometimes do get heated. We often discuss controversial issues, issues that are important about the environment or about ourselves or about society. And in doing that, we form ties with one another and bonds with one another, and we form genuine communities. And I think in the past 20 years, I've been able to form communities with my students because of the type of program that CORE is, and communities with my colleagues, again, because of the interdisciplinary nature of the program. And being a part of that community, I think, is one of the things that I have uh, come to appreciate most about the CORE program and about our college. Finally, I would like to leave you with what I think are the 10 most important two-letter words in the English language. When I was graduating from my undergraduate institution, a professor said, Mike, I want to tell you what the two most important 10-letter words are. And he said they are these. If it is to be, it is up to me. And he said it is up to you to succeed in life. It is up to you to change the world. It is up to you to make the world a better place. Since my experience in CORE, I have come to believe that um, he was actually wrong. I don't think these are the most important 10 two-letter words. Instead, I think these are the most important 10 two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to us. I know it doesn't rhyme, but I think it's truer. I think in a certain sense, it is up to us. CORE is about a whole lot of things, but one of the things it's about is recognizing the dignity of human beings and promoting a world that can respect that dignity. And I think if that is going to happen, it really is up to us. CORE is also about, for the students in CORE's five and six, about our relationship to the environment and the changes that are going on and the protection of ecosystems. And if we're going to help protect our planet and live in a sustainable way, it really is up to us. And CORE, I think, more than anything else, is about the development of human potential and what I would call spiritual growth. And if we're to live in a world where that can occur, again, it is up to us. And I have one final point I would like to leave you with before we turn to Michael, and that is this. The legacy of CORE, I think, is a living legacy. The legacy is you. It's all of the students who have benefited from it. It is all the alumni who have been impacted by it in the lives they lead, in the work that they are doing, and in the way they look at the world around them. And I'd like to share just one brief message that I received last night as I was thinking about what I would say today, this morning. I got an email from a student. I didn't know her very well. I had her for two core classes. I never had her for any of the major classes. And as I was thinking about what I was going to say, I got an email last night, and I thought I would read just a part of the email. She says, Professor Malone, you may not remember me after all of these years. I graduated in 2001, so 16 years ago. But I wanted to let you know I will never forget you. I had you for more than one core class, both of which were engaging and pushed me to think and back my opinions with logic and facts. I remember getting so fired up in some of our discussions that I couldn't sleep at night, and it has made me vastly more understanding, more empathetic, and aware of social injustices as an adult. I am not where I thought I would be when I pictured my future 16 years ago. Instead, I am happier than I ever thought possible and know I am right where I am meant to be. You are one person who impacted my life in a positive way while I was at St. Joe, and I am forever grateful for the core program and everything it has done for me. I am so sorry that the doors are closing. I wish you the best in the future. Thank you for impacting my life. Thank you for the core program. And I'm sure through many others, through their years of service, they have also been impacted. I think there is no greater reward for a teacher, particularly a teacher in the core program, to realize 
that the impact that we have on their lives and on their perspectives, even after 16 years, continues to be a vital one and an important one. And I think the legacy of CORE will continue for a long, long time in the lives of our students and in the lives of their children. And with that, I would like to introduce our final speaker for today. I was followed by, um, as core coordinator by Father Bill Stang, who served for three years as core coordinator. And then after Bill, it was Dr. Michael Nichols who became coordinator of the program. And I will now like to welcome him to give us some final remarks. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Father Tim. Thank you, Dad. This is a difficult thing to do because my connections to this institution run very, very deeply. As you've surmised, there's a family connections. I grew up in this town. I grew up on this campus. And then before even I was a student, I was attending core lectures. And then I became a student, and then I was molded mentally, emotionally, spiritually by the core program. And then I was invited to come back and be a professor. So I have all these levels and all of these different thoughts going through my mind that connect to all of those different tiers. And because of core, whenever I face difficult times otherwise in my life, I've gone back to the lessons that I've learned. I've gone back to the stories and the materials that we have looked at together. And since February, the story that keeps coming back into my mind is one that we read in sophomore year of CORE, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that I've had the great fortune to be able to, to teach and not only just learn about. And this is a story about an ancient Mesopotamian king who is practically all powerful and can do what he wants when he wants to until suddenly his best friend, who he cherishes more than anything else, dies right in front of him. And he realizes that he, too, is going to die. He goes on this long, harrowing quest, which you can see depicted in this artist's rendering, only to fail. He strives, he suffers, and he fails to achieve what he wants most, to live forever. The beginning and end of the story is a description by Gilgamesh of the walls that surround his city, the walls of Uruk. And at the beginning, when he's most arrogant, he sees it as this, this flagrant display of wealth and power and pride. When he comes back after his failed journey, he describes them again, but he's different. And I think there's something in that change that we can learn from. And I'm going to come back to that in, in a little bit of time. But first, to talk about CORE from my perspective, it's you know, this nationally recognized program, but it has this other dimension to it, right? That it binds us together as Pumas. And so it's nationally recognized, but locally loved. It's this thing that we cherish together, that we've shared. It can be kind of a laboratory experiment to scholars and academics elsewhere, but it's something that's dear to us because we go through it and experience it. It had all of these goals at its inception to bring everyone together, faculty, students, as a common experience, to communicate the Christian humanist message, and also just to plain change students' lives. And all of those goals are bound up in this brick sculpture, which is on the other side of that wall in the foyer. And if you have a moment after lecture, if you are of that inclination, you might take a stroll by it and look at it. It's filled with a number of wonderful symbols in it. And the title itself is a multi-leveled symbol. It's about transformations from the alpha, the beginning, to omega, the fulfillment, the transformation of grapes and weed into the loaves and the wine of the Eucharist, the body and the blood. And also, you have the different emblems of the liberal arts education, the scale for logic, the instrument for music, and how education transforms people. And holding it all together is the cross in the middle, about our identity as a Catholic institution. This is what we stand for. This is who we are. This is what core is. This is what binds us all together. And we've been 
great at it. I pulled these out of the archives as well, these national awards that we've won. Back in the late 80s, we were named as one of the top five general education programs in the country. And as the story shows there, that puts us in league with Harvard and the University of Chicago. We were voted that by 1,310 academic deans across the country. This article from the Indianapolis Star mentions how the Secretary of Education in the late 80s, William Bennett, picked us out as a shining example of a college that makes students better people because of its core program. And here we were named as one college that makes a difference, that develops character. And we did that through core. I also sought out some alumni comments, and these are some ones I couldn't include all of the ones that I got, so I just picked out a few. Matt Hess, who graduated a few years ago, focused on the skills that it gave him, how it made him a, a competent professional. Doug Baker, who was a freshman the very first year that I started, I had him in core one, says that it helped him on all these different levels to form an opinion, debate effectively, make decisions ethically, and then educate others that he's going to pass it on to the next group who need it. And then just last year, Jenny Weir shared the anecdote that it was about the interaction with other students in the classroom. It was learning where other people were coming from and being able to get that sense of their position and to recognize, you've got your point and I have mine. Maybe we can find some common ground. A few years ago, we also gathered as part of a subcommittee on mission for accreditation some anonymous student comments about CORE. And these were some of the things that I pulled out from that to share with you today. One student remarked that the integration was the part that stood out the most, about the melding of science and faith, that we are a united endeavor of intelligence and faith. One suggested that he came to college a changed person because of the integrity that was developed. And the last one that I'm going to share here is one that when I first read it just slayed me. I had to take a moment in my office to think about it because it was everything that I ever would have wanted to hear from a student. I feel I am a whole person. And that's what we've done. We've made whole people. And in this last year, and even some going back several years, uh, we've had great members of our, of our team. I've been really honored to work with these individuals. It takes a lot of faculty coming together to administer each of the different cores and work as a team. And so I want to recognize some of those individuals if they're here today. For core one, we had Jonathan Nichols. For core two, we had Jordan Lysing. For core three, Father Bill Stang. Core five, Landa Zimmer. Core six, Ann Gull. Core seven, Susan Chatton. I don't know if she's here today. Core eight is Jody Watkins. Core nine is brother Rob Reuter. Also. And core 10 is father Tim McFarland. And the other thing that stands out to me from that list is that we just didn't talk about interdisciplinary work. We didn't just give it lip service. From top to bottom, here's what we have working together to make this program go. We had an English professor. We had a political scientist. We had someone from biology. We had a scholar of religion. We had an education professor. We had a doctor of chemistry. We had a history professor. We had someone with background in anthropology. We had philosophy, and we had theology. There is no place in this country, no institution, no campus that you can go to that works across the disciplinary lines like that. And so that is the thing that the other coordinators have remarked on that makes this very difficult is that 
when this, when this goes away, it won't be found again. Because that's not the way other, other colleges and universities work, sadly. And so if there were a couple of things, the biggest takeaways for me from the perspective on both sides of the desk, both sides of the lectern, I would boil it down to, to these things. So one of the big things that you ought to take away no matter what level of core you've accomplished, whether you've been out of core for years, whether you've only had the chance to take a couple semesters, whether you're done, whether you're close to done. The first is that core is intended to balance out and to resonate with that major that you have. A vocational education will help you make a good living and be able to provide for yourself, but core is to help you think about how to live a good life. And those two are not the same thing. Living a good life means being able to separate out the important from the peripheral, the deep from the superficial, the things that really matter when you get down to it at the end of the day. This was an opportunity here through CORE to really delve into that issue of, well, who am I? Who are you? To be able to think about, what do I stand for? What kind of change do I want to make in the world? There's a fantastic quote from David Denby, who studied a number of different curriculum across the country. And he said that when you go to college, you are here, you're at college to build a self. A self, a notion of who you are is not something that just drops out of the sky or sprouts up from the ground. You have to build it. And in CORE, we give you the raw materials and the questions to build that self. You know, just like a physical trainer helps you to build your body, we are trying to build minds and build souls here. And so I would invite you, just like I have throughout my life using CORE, to try to take the stories and the lessons we've learned and use them as a guide, as a, as a compass for figuring out where you want to go, and as that, that pole star to figure out your direction. And to build that thread through, I want to pull up some different texts that you'll at least the students in the room are probably familiar with, that I'm comforted by going back over this material to think that, well, just like we learned in Core 1, Jeanette Walls was able to pull herself out of just horrific circumstances to make herself into the person she became. In Core 2, we learn from Frederick Douglass that if you are determined, nothing, absolutely nothing, can put out the fire for knowledge and learning. In Core 3, Plato and Socrates tell us, through the allegory of the cave, that even a hard truth, a painful truth, is much better than an easy lie. And in Core 4, we learn about those gospel values of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and we're never a failure as long as we practice those. In your intercultural core, this junior year especially, your experience to philosophers and ideas from outside the Western world. And we can pull something maybe from what you've looked at most recently, China, and the philosopher Confucius who says that a good person is not measured by money, by possessions, but by whether you have a single thread that you can pull throughout your life that informs who you are and what you do. And in Core 5 and 6, we learn that that single thread brings us all together across the world. We have a common home that we must take care of. We're never disconnected. We're one human family struggling together. But as I started, the story I keep coming back to is Gilgamesh. Is that he fails in his journey. He doesn't achieve immortality. But he still triumphs. Because by the end, when he looks at those walls shown here in this archaeological dig, and he sees them that second time, he doesn't see the physical structure. He doesn't see the ornamentation. He doesn't see the grandeur. He sees them for what they really represent, the fragility of dreams, that desire to leave something behind, to be remembered by. And so for us, for our Puma community, that's core. It was represented by our brick sculpture here. And outside, by the sculpture, you'll see pamphlets that describe the symbolism and there's a passage in there that's haunted me since February. It's written by my father, and it reads, as long as this brick sculpture transformations lasts, it is the hope of those who designed it 
and raise the funds for it that faculty and students and Corps will be reminded of and inspired by the truth and beauty of the Christian humanist vision. I say that haunts me. But it also gives me hope. And I have some hope today. Not because I know what's going to happen to this sculpture, not because I know what's going to happen to CORE, because I don't. What I do know is that in the 1960s, the founders of the CORE program believed in this education of the whole person, the united endeavor of faith. That in the 1970s, during its most uncertain time, that faculty believed. And in the 1980s, when CORE achieved national prominence, those faculty believed. In the 90s, when they educated me, they believed. And in the 2000s, when I was hired back, we all believed together. And today, even after all that's happened, I, and I know I can speak for others in this room, we still believe in this education of the whole person, this making people whole and feeding their souls as well as their minds. And so when I look at the audience, I see a lot of alumni, which is awesome. I see a lot of students, which is awesome. I see my faculty members. I see my own family. And we're not just those different groups. We are a community of seekers after the truth, because that's what CORE has made us. And so as long as we seek after the truth, as long as we pursue this love of lifelong learning, as long as we strive to live up to our gospel values, what the core program stood for and what the college stood for is very, very much alive. So I want to thank the founders of this program for doing something brilliant. And I want to thank my fellow core coordinators. And I want to thank the core directors and the dedicated faculty. And I want to thank the students for learning with us that's the wonderful thing about the core. We get to learn with you and alongside you. And I want to wish you the best in all that you have to do. Thank you for coming. God bless all of you. Now, I know what's going to happen with CORE. Every one of you who goes out into education is going to be a seed of CORE. The schools you go to, you will be able to help them to get closer to the vision we got here. And if you think, well, I'm just one person, I can't do it, you can because it happened here. If any single one person made CORE happen, father, mentor, teacher, pusher, it was this man. And so again, let us thank John Nichols. It was a community event, a community endeavor.